Okay, so I've broken this particular lecture series up into two uh, different video lectures because um, there's a lot of material here and I don't want to go through slide by slide and read off the material you guys can read on your own. What I want to do is just add a little bit to some of these slides to make sure that you guys understand of the importance of, of looking at sleep in, in both animals and humans. So this particular one is just focusing on the animal component of this particular series of uh, slides. And so I'm not gonna go through every single slide, but I do wanna point out the most important parts of each one. Um, another thing that uh, you might notice is that there are a lot of uh, articles that are posted as additional readings. Uh, what these articles do is essentially supplement a lot of the things that I that I talk about and if you're interested in a particular area it really adds to your learning experience in especially in an online course but really any educational course you take it's really you get out of it what you put into it and so you can choose to not read anything and, and probably skate by um, for the most part. But if you really want to get a good idea of the whole class and a good idea of all the, the, the parts, then you're going to want to at least go through and, and browse some of those, those articles because they really do add um, really well to, to the lectures. So just to kind of give you an idea, this lecture is broken up into uh, de defining sleep, figuring out what is sleep, what isn't sleep, um, and then looking at a particular criteria, because you have to define what sleep is in order for uh, you to be able to measure it. Um, if you say that sleep is X, Y, Z, then you want to measure X, Y, Z whenever you're, you're measuring sleep. Um, and so one challenge that we have, and I've discussed this in a previous video, is essentially that not every sleep scientist actually agrees on what sleep is. So when you look at sleep in different species, for example, here we're going to talk about simple, organism in, uh, simple organisms, insects, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, land mammals, marine mammals, and then eventually in humans. Um, all of these different, these are very different species. And we have to think about what does sleep mean for each of these species? Do we need different definitions? Do we need, uh, you know, pieces? Like how, how do we need to, to look at this? So just to kind of give you an idea of some of the terms that we have that are actually not considered sleep, and a lot of people confuse, confuse these terms. So quiescent is essentially this inactivity or dormancy. It's almost like a hibernation, but it's, it, it's almost like a, excuse me, not a hibernation. It's almost like a, a rest state, um, but not quite. It's just uh, the animal has shut down for a period of time it's dormant for a particular period. It's, it's, it's in a quiet mode. So that's what we'd like to think of quiescent, is in a quiet mode. Rest is this reduced activity, but you have no loss of consciousness. But we tend to see that the animal is not very responsive. It's not asleep, okay? Because we do see sleep as being a non-responsive or, or less responsive state, but it is not unconscious. It's still able to respond, it's just not as responsive as when it's alert. Torpor is what I would say is very often confused with hibernation. Torpor is essentially this decreased physical activity, but you tend to see a decrease in body temperature and metabolic rate, which is similar to hibernation, except that we see that the animal is easily aroused. And this can occur, occur daily. We, can, we actually see this in bats, for example, um, where they go in this inactivity mode, this torpor mode, which looks a lot like hibernation, except the difference is, is that they can be easily aroused. Finally, we see hibernation as being the state of inactivity. There's metabolic depression, just like torpor, except the difference is, is that the animal is not easily aroused. And when you do arouse it, it becomes very, very uh, confused um, because it's in a very um, inactive state. Now, when it comes to, for example, bears hibernating, a lot of people say, well, they're just asleep. And it's actually not the case. 
uh, animals that hibernate actually do experience sleep during hibernation. They, they do go through cycles of sleep that are independent from the hibernation. So it's an important thing to note. So the question is, is do animals experience sleep the same way, in the same state, the same types as humans? And so one thing that we have to distinguish is circadian changes. Now, we're going to talk about the brain next week. We're also going to talk about circadian rhythm. And so don't be, you know, uh, if you don't know much about the brain, don't be too, too scared off by the use of these terms. But as you can see here, I've put that the uh, that circadian changes in sleep, they're, they're all controlled by the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain, and that is like our body clock. And, and animals have a super, many, many animals have suprachiasmatic nuclei that, uh, that control this, this body clock. And so we have to make sure that it's not just a, a daily change. Circa is about, and DN is a day. So these are all the changes that occur in your body um, and in an animal's body throughout the day, for example, heart rate, blood pressure, um, uh, glucose, all of these things we actually can see um, on a uh, hormones, all that actually change um, from uh, during the day from hour to hour. We can actually map it and predict it. Um, and so when we talk about alertness, we also see circadian changes in alertness. In humans, we see what we call two circadian dips. You have a dip usually around after lunchtime, you start feeling really sleepy, and then you have another dip right before bedtime. Now, in some people, this changes, and if you're you know, not on a good schedule, of course, that can, that can uh, change your, your, your schedule. But what we find is that with these um, circadian changes, we have to distinguish that from, from sleep, not just the changes that we see from, from, day, from hour to hour. Now, just because we see reduced activity and reduced alertness in the animal, we can't just simply say that must be sleep. Because we do see this re reduced activity and we do see changes in alertness in different states, states, states and stages and things like that throughout the day. And we also need to make sure that we are uh, distinguishing sleep from hibernation, torpor, rest, and quiescent periods because, of course, as I've said before, sleep is actually present in hibernation. So what are the criteria of sleep? What must be met in order for us to say, yes, that animal sleeps? First, it needs to be rapidly reversible. Um, you know, it's something that, uh, that an animal can be aroused from. So if an animal is immobile, okay, uh, for, for whatever reason, um, that animal can be, should be able to be mobile again. Now, one of the videos that I've included, which is a very fascinating video uh, uh, on, on Moodle, is of a frog essentially being frozen. Um, the, so the frog is, is frozen in the winter and then thaws out um, and then hops along when, when the weather warms up. Now, that would not be defined as sleep because that animal is frozen solid and that's not a rapidly reversible state of immobility. That frog is frozen until it's defrosted over multiple hours. So one major thing has got to be rapidly reversible. You must see a reduced sensory responsiveness. So that must mean that an animal is in a state where it is not as responsive as it is when it's alert. So if you poke at it, um, you know, there's got to be a different threshold from when it's alert from when it's in this particular state. We also talk about sleep being homo homeostatically regulated. Now, this sounds super complicated, but it really isn't. Homeostasis is just an, a balance, right, in your body. When you are hungry, you eat, and then you're balanced. When you are thirsty, you drink, and then you're balanced. Um, when you're tired, you sleep, and then it's balanced. So you, your body is always trying to achieve this, this wonderful balance of being perfect. And so we know that when you are in a particular state and you are tired, um, then, you, then you sleep to uh, relieve that tiredness. So any lost sleep is made up with this need, this, 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 this drive for increased sleep. And then we also have something called a sleep rebound, which is essentially if you go four hours, if you, if you deprive yourself four hours of sleep, then you're going to sleep more the next night right? It may not be four exact hours, but you do sleep more the subsequent night 
um, if you deprive yourself of sleep. So this is what we refer to as a rebound. We also know that there's an evolutionary problem here. And that is if we don't need sleep, okay, then we wouldn't sleep. And that is that it must serve some vital function for us to put ourselves in a vulnerable position to make up for this, this lost sleep that we have, so to force a sleep rebound must be beneficial to our species in some way if it's, because it, it, if you really think about it, and, and, and I'm talking just sort of an animalistic sense, sleep is actually pretty dangerous because you're putting yourself in a very vulnerable position and animals put themselves in vulnerable positions by sleeping, by being less alert, by being vulnerable. So we know that it must serve some major, really, really important function if we put ourselves in that position to make up for sleep. Also, we see that we can actually measure cortical activity in the brain, in animals, and in humans, and we can actually see patterns of high or low voltage cortical activity depending on what kind of sleep that the animal is getting um, in, in mammals and um, what, what, in what stage of sleep that they're getting and also compared to when they're alert. So we actually see these changes in, in voltage in cortical activity. Now, the problem here is uh, that when you consider that there are over 60,000 species of vertebrate, uh, vertebrate species, um, we've only studied about 50 or so of them. And so the problem here is essentially that we really don't know a lot about sleep. And the ones that we have studied, um, there are a few that we have not really studied that well. There are a few that are just simply not, uh, not really, really well studied. So for example, um, sleep deprivation uh, in certain animals, for example, we uh, study the Drosophila, which is the fruit fly, very heavily. We study the, uh, the, um, the Danio, which is a very, very... Um, a very, very well studied uh, animal, which is a zebrafish. Um, and uh, we study rats, we study cats, um, dogs, um, humans, of course. Uh, those have been studied very heavily, but there are a few animals that really, even though they count uh, as part of these species that we've studied, really have not been heavily studied. We may have one or two studies on them, and that's certainly not enough to uh, actually make some really good conclusions about the entire species. One example of something that we've studied that has yielded some really strange things and they can't be replicated in other animals is a particular kind of sleep deprivation in rats. So there's a particular uh, technique called disc over the water. And I'm gonna show you guys that you don't have this, this uh, picture in your, uh, in your slide, but I do wanna kind of show you guys and I'm going to do a, uh, oops. I'm going to do a spotlight here. Now, here, what we see, this is called disc over the water. Now, th this is a technique that's used to keep animals awake. So you have a control rat here who is fine, not sleep deprived, it's, it's just a regular rat. And that rat is gonna be moving around, okay? It's going to be moving around. When it moves around, it actually moves this disc right here. And so what this does is it forces the rat on the other side to move because if, the rat does not move, it's going to get knocked off. And if you can see here, there's a pool of water. And this water and you know, rat, it's deep enough so that the rat will swim and the rat is not gonna to wanna to fall into the water. So you see here that the, the rats are provided with food and water and this rotating platform. And so essentially what ends up happening is this, this rat is very active because it's alert and it's not sleep deprived. And um, this particular rat is going to be deprived completely of sleep. Now, if this rat doesn't move, you see here there's some electrodes here, you can actually sort of buzz the rat and get it to, to move again. Um, or the same thing here, um, you can also do things like uh, see what's going on in the brain and you can hook them up with different electrodes to see if you want to electrocute them uh, mildly just to get them moving or if you want to um, uh, actually look at something in the brain. Now there are different renditions of the the, the disc over water. Um, some of them do have sort of electrified electrified floors, so you can you don't need this other rat, but you can get them to sort of walk on their own. Um, it just depends on the situation. Now with this particular 
um, technique, very interesting here, is that we see a particular pattern of, um, of, of damage that occurs. So this would be a recovered rat or a normal rat, one that is not uh, that has not gone through this procedure as a, an experimental rat, um, what we find is that there's a particular pattern of uh, hair loss. Um, you see that the, the fur actually changes color. Um, they'll have sores on their paws. Um, you'll see uh, things like their uh, particular hormone levels and cholesterol levels will actually drop um, very dangerously. Um, and so that can be that can be really um, dangerous for, for the mouse. Now, another, or the rat. Now, another thing, and I'm, and I'm gonna go backwards here. Okay, one thing that, you, that, that I really wanna mention here is the fact that in rats, okay, what we find is that uh, in this particular technique, we see that we see an increased in body temperature, so they're actually getting warmer, we see more food intake, but we see that they are actually dropping in their weight. We see that pattern of fur discolor is dis discoloration. We actually see them also losing fur in some places and lesions in the skin, meaning that they're actually getting sores on themselves. After a period of time for about two to three weeks, we start seeing the body temperature goes from increase to starts to fall to decrease. And then in about two or three weeks of an animal doing this consecutively, we see death. We have never seen death due to sleep deprivation in any other animal using this technique. And that's very interesting. When we do also, when we deprive rats using other techniques, it never really leads to death like this does. And we don't see the patterns like this does. Um, we're gonna talk about sleep deprivation in humans um, and, and the patterns of that. You know, there's an argument that if we don't sleep, we die. But we really haven't been able to rep. Well, we really can't replicate that because it's a, it's dangerous and it's and it's unethical. But there is an argument that our brain will force us to sleep in what we refer to as micro sleeps. But what we do find is that you know we do see um, a lot of, of of side effects of not sleeping that can be very dangerous. But this is the only technique with this only species that can actually produce. Uh, absolute death in, in a period of time. When we use this technique in pigeons, which is a very also a very well studied animal, um, we find that these these body chain body temperature changes are not there, um, and the metabolic changes aren't there, which we see in the hormones, um, and they don't die. Now it's not good for them, but we also see that it doesn't have the same effect. It doesn't kill them like it does with rats. Now in humans, we see, again, and we'll talk about this in much more detail later, we see temperature changes. For example, we see a decrease. We don't see an increase in, in temperature. We see decreases in temperature. We see weight gain. But again, doesn't produce the same autonomic changes that we see in rats um, in, in this particular technique. Now, when, um, so, you know, just to kind of give you an idea, and I'm not gonna go through uh, these different species, but, um, just to kind of give you an idea, looking at very, very simple organisms, for example, dinoflagellites, um, which is the, what you see on the right there, um, we do actually see that these simple organisms don't necessarily have sleep like we define it, but they do in fact have circadian rhythm activity. And um, very interesting, uh, for example, to the right here, we're gonna talk about this in the circadian uh, rhythm uh, section. Um, we can actually see them, uh, these particular organisms, having a daily rhythm and actually lighting up uh, at night. Very, very neat little, little creatures. Um, we have uh, you know, looked at a few species of insects. As you can see, there's over 700,000 of them, um, but we don't see REM. We do see um, in uh, cockroaches, bees, and scorpions this quiescent behavior. Now, one thing that we do see is in fruit flies or Drosophila, which is a very heavily studied uh, species, because we've been able to map the genome. Um, it's it's a very simple species to for us to be able to, to to talk about. It's very heavily studied in sleep. We actually do see that it it does the the fruit fly does sleep. The Drosophila does sleep. It meets all the behavioral criteria of sleep, but we don't know if this is the same exact type of sleep that we see in humans, and that's 
that's probably due to the fact that the, the fruit fly has a different nervous system than, than humans do. So <clears throat> one paper that I included on here was the uh, Sorelli paper. And I want you to be able to actually, um, to, to, I want you to read that paper and look through it because it does give a really good uh, breakdown of a lot of these different species. Here you can see in, in fish, for example, we've only looked at about 10 species of fish. The zebrafish, perch, and tilapia are probably the most commonly ones. And you can see here that we have um, some evidence of, of, of some sort of rest, um, their circadian effects. Um, a lot of people say, well, how do you, how do you deprive uh, fish of sleep. One common way is to actually use a light, um, but the problem is, is that fish respond to light. So if you give too much um, stimulation, uh, if you give a lot of light stimulation, the idea is, is that that's how you deprive them of sleep. But light also stimulates a fish. So it can be, it can be very, very tricky in how we study sleep in fish, but we do see that they have some sort of, of, of form of sleep. Um, in amphibians, you see we have over 6,000 amphibian species. Um, one thing that's really interesting that, that, uh, that, we've, that we've looked at is frogs, essentially. Um, and there is a study that, that I posted. Um, it was done in the 1960s um, on the bullfrog. Now, one thing that we found about the bullfrog is uh, due to the, the, the evidence that we've, that we've collected, we've actually found that the scientists came to the conclusion that frogs actually don't sleep. Um, however, this is a really dangerous conclusion to make because it's one study, uh, it was done in the 1960s, and it was based on some, some very questionable methods with some questionable conclusions. So they found that the bullfrogs actually were more alert, not alert, more responsive during this quote unquote period of activity, this inactivity, this idea of sleep, than when they were alert, uh, when, when they were active. And so they were like, well, they're more responsive. So they have no loss of vigilance and that's because they need to survive. And so they actually concluded, the scientists concluded that they must not sleep. They, they don't meet the criteria of sleep um, because they are more alert when they're inactive than when they're, they're actually active. I am a little, I, you know, I don't, I don't think that this is a great conclusion to make. I think that we need to study the bullfrog much more, uh, much more vigorously. Uh, and honestly, you know, if I asked you a question on a test that says, you know, what is the one animal that scientists say doesn't sleep? The answer would be bullfrog um, because it is, it is listed in that study and, and the conclusions are made that bullfrogs don't sleep. However, I would argue um, that if you that you know if you look at the bullfrog over a series of dozens of studies over many years, we probably would come to different conclusions, um, or at least uh, have a better idea of what's going on. Especially because their cousins, the tree frog here, um, they actually they do sleep, even though we don't have uh, indication of of what we refer to as human REM sleep. Um, you know, we see that there are other species within the same sort of uh, type of animal that that sort of contradicts this evidence. Here's a, an idea uh, just to kind of give you, this is a picture to give you an idea of how you collect um, this kind of data in frogs. Um, so you can actually place electrodes on frogs and, and get their, their uh, electrical um, brain waves. You can actually get a heart rate and, and breathing and all that. And you can actually see at the bottom here, that's sort of how they end up uh, testing them um, and, and keeping them still and trying to figure out uh, what's going on with them. You can measure temperature, you can measure brain waves and things like that. So this is just a kind of a, give you a visual of how you would do that in a frog, because I'm sure you're probably wondering about that. So again, these charts uh, came from the Sorelli study. It's a really good study to, or paper, because it's about several different studies. Um, I would say, you know, their, their uh, argument that the, the bullfrog sleep is, is the definition is unresolved or the answer is unresolved. I would definitely agree with that. But if I were to ask you on a test, that would be a sort of a tricky one um, that the bullfrog actually is not considered to sleep. So I'm um, just going through and looking at, you know, different reptiles. You can see here 
that uh, you can read these slides and in birds, or you can kind of see what kind of conclusions have been made by a lot of different um, studies. Um, the white crowned sparrow has been studied uh, pretty well in, in this sleep field. Um, and uh, we have some really interesting things with, with birds in particular that they tend to, um, we see that uh, they don't need to rebound on sleep, for example, when they're, when they're migrating. Um, they've actually evolved to uh, be able to withstand this sort of decrease in sleep without the effects of sleep deprivation during this migratory period. Um, so we actually see that they are able to have reduced sleep during this, when they're migrating, when they're flying, we see this reduced sleep and they're not actually experiencing major effects from that. And that's one a special thing that, that, that is really important to note is that, you know, we see these differences in how um, different animals' brains react to sleep. For example, birds, when they're flying, we see one hemisphere of their brain sleeping while the other one doesn't. We also see this in animals like dolphins, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so looking here, uh, you know, we've, we've studied land mammals, but the problem is, is that we study them in zoo, um, settings, not in their absolute natural conditions. Um, so we don't know what, what happens when the animals migrate. We don't know what happens to their sleep. Um, when you look at animals in the zoo, they have constant food. They don't have predators coming after them. They don't migrate. And this changes the way that they sleep. So the question is, is of course, how do they sleep in their natural settings? Um, and, and what does that, how does that differ from, from the studies that we have done given them in the situation that they're in, uh, where they have limited space and, and constant food? Um, we know that the properties of sleep, of course, vary substantially across different species, um, but uh, all of the domesticated species, for example, rats, mice, cats, dogs, monkeys, all meet the conventional definition of sleep and it looks similar to, to humans. Just to kind of give you <clears throat> a very quick, because um, this is, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to redo everything off here, but um, the uh, Odidari, uh, Odid uh, Odidaridae, um, which is the uh, fur seal sea lion, do, they do actually have, uh, excuse me, the Odoriidae. Um, the Odoriidae have different sleep patterns on land versus in the water. And so when they're in the water, we see that of course they can't go in REM um, the same way that they can go on land because if they go through REM, then their bodies will become paralyzed and they'll sink and, and drown. Um, and so we actually see different patterns of sleep in the water versus on the land. Um, and uh, we see that they, they cycle through the REM and non-REM sleep, but when uh, they see that they actually don't need to rebound that REM sleep um, on land that they miss in the water. So kind of like how birds adapt to when they're migrating and they get less sleep, they don't need to rebound that sleep uh, when, they, when they are finished migrating. We see the same sort of thing in, uh, in seals and sea lions from being in the water to being on land. Cetaceans uh, have a very interesting um, sleep pattern. Um, again, they, they have to adapt being in the water. So we see that they go through slow wave sleep one hemisphere at a time. Um, we see that they tend to uh, float um, while they're in this unit hemispheric slow wave sleep, um, but they, they are swimming at the time. Um, and they tend to, to circle in counterclockwise directions, but if you'll notice in the paper that I included, there's actually some argument there about what direction that they're swimming in um, and why. And that's a really very interesting paper for you to take a look at. We also see um, a lot of uh, conflicting evidence about, you know, if we deprive dolphins of sleep, do they need to make it up? Um, what, what kind of sleep do they need to make up? Uh, we see also that when the cetaceans are, are newborn, uh, we see that they tend to be completely uh, active for four to six weeks, um, which with no indication of needing to sleep during that period. Uh, but again, you know, we've, we haven't really studied this, in, in my opinion, to the point where we can definitively say that, especially considering that a lot of the, uh, the study of dolphins and killer whales, for example, are in not necessarily zoo settings, but it could be in 
um, you know, uh, confined settings, and in, in a lot of cases, zoo settings. Um, so this is an example of a dolphin's um, a brainwave activity, and as you can see here, it starts out in a waking phase, both the right and left hemisphere. So I'm going to do a real quick spotlight here. So in both the right and left hemisphere, they're, they're in a waking state. Then the right hemisphere is going to go into intermediate sleep, which is kind of like um, our stages one and two, um, and then go in, you can see here, the left hemisphere is still awake. Now the right hemisphere is going to go from intermediate to slow wave sleep with the left hemisphere still awake so that they can breathe um, and move. And then here you can see there's a switch that happens. The left hemisphere does not need to go into intermediate sleep because it, it's already in that one of the hemispheres already in that state. So there's a switch that happens that the right hemisphere will revert back to wake and then the left hemisphere will then go to sleep, um, to slow wave sleep. So very interesting um, brainwave activity there. So um, this, uh, I'm gonna end the slideshow here and then uh, pick up on humans on the next lecture. If you have any questions, you can put them on the um, question forum or you can send me an email. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this lecture series.